All right. Well, we're in Ephesians 2. We're uh, in our regular study here in Ephesians 2. Managed to get in here early enough in the week to uh, put something together for, uh, for this morning. And just... Uh, uh, a really a, an amazing, uh, you know, portion of scripture, uh, and uh, and probably the most condensed uh, portion we have, uh, you know, really uh, uh, the gospel right here in these uh, these ten verses, and um, and we're going to be looking at that this morning. So why don't we uh, we pray before we uh, jump into this uh, great passage of scripture? Father, we uh, do come to you and pray that um, uh, we would come to a more complete understanding of what it is to be saved by grace. And as the title of our message indicates, how glorious is your grace uh, to us, how undeserving we are uh, to be recipients of, of your grace. Lord, so I pray that our, our hearts would be uh, enlarged in, uh, in, uh, in a greater capacity to love you because we uh, come to your word, Lord, with open hearts and in a desire to, uh, as we've uh, Paul prays for this church to have the, the, uh, their eyes uh, opened, enlightened, uh, Lord, in terms of knowing your love and your grace, and, uh, and just take the truth of your word and use it to minister to our hearts this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, again, this is a little different in terms of this particular book study, uh, because I mentioned uh, I'm giving you some pictures or images that help you uh, remember the, the key key passages. Can I... Uh, you know, the, the uh, context is I did this for a Bible college class uh, so that uh, they could remember the image, they could remember the key phrases. If they could remember that, they could get an A on the final. And um, <laughs> I, 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 I thought, I, I'm really getting old or jaded or something because I thought about this and I thought, because um, I, I, um, I also t uh, teach, uh, you know, Bible college classes, of course, and in, in another country where it's not legal. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I don't have to give those kids pictures. <laughs> they're, they all get AIDS. They're, they're there, they're focused, and they're there for a reason, and uh, uh, there's a price to pay for them being there and so forth, so it's a little different. But I uh, hate to say it, but American kids, I gotta give them some pictures, so I'm gonna give them to So here, here's, here's, here's the first one. Uh, uh, and this is the uh, opening half of chapter one. Uh, the riches that are, are in Christ Jesus, and we enumerated them, uh, and, uh, and we said, uh, in this image anyway, that uh, if you have a MasterCard, you can go to an ATM machine and uh, scan that chip on your wrist. No, it's not there yet. You can, you can put in your MasterCard uh, and, uh, and get some money out. Uh, but with the Master's card that we receive, in a sense, when we are born again by God's Spirit, uh, as His children, we have a Master's card with which we can access the riches uh, uh, that are ours uh, in Christ Jesus. Uh, then the second image that we looked at uh, last week was the second half of, uh, of chapter 2 uh, with an uh, uh, emphasis there on the power of God. How, uh, what kind of power has God given us in terms of his spirit? Paul says it's the same power that raised Christ from, from the dead. Uh, it's ours because of our relationship uh, in him. We try to, at least in this image, to say it's like an extension cord that we plug in and remains plugged in, as opposed to, I could have put a picture of a couple of batteries up there, and sometimes we think the Christian experience, the Christian life is like that, where uh, uh, we're, we're kind of battery operated by the power of God, and we have to periodically, when we feel a need, go get our batteries charged again. And certainly, uh, we could say uh, men's retreats and conferences and those things kind of put some uh, wind into our sails, uh, of course, uh, but in reality, we need and we must just stay plugged in uh, into uh, to Jesus Christ uh, each and every day. That's how we're going to be growing uh, in Christ. And that was the emphasis that we looked at uh, in our last message. Now, before we show you the next image, i got to tell you the story that goes with it or else it won't make sense. And I'll preface by saying, and yes, this is a very corny joke, but uh, I'll use it to help make the point anyway. One of my uh, Baptist pastor uh, friends, uh, told, told me this joke a number of years ago. And it goes like this. There's a guy who's uh, new in town, a small town, uh, and he wants to go get a haircut. So he's an old-fashioned, you know, barber shop where they do the shave and all that stuff. And he goes in there, and he um, meets the guy that's the owner. He's right there in the first chair and says, yeah, I want to get a haircut, but uh, while I'm here, I'd like to get a shave uh, as well. Uh, and the guy says, okay, well, I'll, I'll cut your hair. Uh, that's my wife down there, Grace. 
and uh, she'll give you the shave uh, 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 after you get your haircut. Okay, well, that sounds great. So he gets his haircut. He goes down, and, um, and Grace gives him a shave and everything. And, man, he looks in the mirror and thinks, I should have done this a while ago. This is like the best shave I've ever had in my life. And then yeah, he goes on his way, uh, and he gets up the next day. He looks in the mirror, washes his face, and goes, wow, I'm, I'm in pretty good shape here. I, I don't even need to shave today. Uh, well, this goes on for four or five days. And he's, he's like, wow, I... I, this has never happened in my life as an adult. I, I still don't need to shave. He's walking by the barber shop. He goes back in. He sees the guy, the owner. He's in front. He goes in, hey, I just got to tell you, I, you know, uh, I got to thank you. I never had a shave like this before. You know, I mean, it's been almost a week now. I, I look pretty much the same. And, and he says to him, then he says that, well, you know, once you're shaved by grace, you're always shaved. <laughs> That's the story. I told you it was corny. <laughs> That's the story. So here's the image. <laughs> if you can remember that and remember the story, you'll remember the emphasis uh, of chapter 2, verse 1 to 10 uh, here uh, in uh, this uh, wonderful passage of Scripture, uh, the glory of grace. Well, let's look first at the reality of our situation being in a fallen world. There's three aspects that Paul mentions here in verses 1 to 3, where he says, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And were by nature children of wrath, just as the other. So the first aspect of this reality uh, is the fact that we're separated from God. We see that in the words, you were dead in trespasses uh, and sins. So I want to point out, it's not a figure of speech. It's what we were. It's not we were like that. No, spiritually, we were dead in, in our trespasses and sins. Now, Paul mentions... Uh, Jews and Gentiles. He says, all of us, all of us were in this condition. We were dead spiritually. Uh, the prophet Isaiah put it this way in Isaiah 59, where he says, behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, uh, nor his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. The problem is not God. The problem is us. Our sins have separated us from him. Now, Paul, writing to uh, Timothy in 1 Timothy, is going to make reference to uh, two widows and how we treat widows uh, within the church. And he's going to mention one that's in this condition of being spiritually dead. 1 Timothy 5.5. 5. Now, she who is really a widow and left alone, trusts in God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But, in contrast to that, but she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. Paul says it's possible to be dead even though, even though you're living. And Paul says uh, that is the condition we're all in. We're all dead in our trespasses uh, uh, in sins before we come to faith uh, in Jesus Christ. Uh, it's not enough just to be walking around in the body uh, when we're dead spiritually. And uh, I pulled this story out because it just cracks me up and uh, uh, it uh, kind of fits here, this idea of what it is to be dead, but pretending like we're alive somehow. Uh, Jeremy Betham, who was a philosopher and the father of uh, Ulitarianism, uh, he uh, uh, apparently was a fairly wealthy guy and when he died in England, left his entire estate to the University College Hospital in London on one condition, uh, that his body be preserved uh, kept in the hospital, there in the basement or whatever, a morgue of some type, uh, and that his body uh, be able to continue as it did before when he was alive, when they would have their annual board meeting once a year. So for over 160 years, they wheel Jeremy up into the boardroom, uh, dead as a doornail. They go around and they reel, and they take attendance, uh, and as they do when it comes to him, the chairman of the board says, Jeremy Betham, Present, but not voting. Hey, glad to have you here, Jeremy. And thank you for the money. Take them away. But uh, uh, present, but not voting. 
uh, he, is, uh, he is dead, dead, but still trying to act like he's still alive. There's a lot of people in this world, and we were, Paul says, all of us, Jew or Gentile, doesn't matter our background, uh, we've, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. John Stott, the British uh, theologian, says we should not hesitate to reaffirm that a life without God, however physically fit and mentally alert the person may be, is a living death, and that those who live it are dead even while they are living. Now, how does Paul support this statement? Well, he does it uh, in verses 2 and 3 uh, in the following ways. He says it's because we're in this world. So there's the world that's an issue in terms of our separation from our God, our deadness. There is the reference to Satan or the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is at work and those who are disobedient. And then he makes reference to our flesh or our sin nature. Uh, that's the trifecta that we have going against us uh, as being apart from Christ, dead in our trespasses and sin, uh, living in the world. That term is used 186 times in the New Testament. In almost every instance, it's a reference to an evil kind of connotation. Uh, the world, the world system. Uh, John in his epistle says that, uh, uh, that uh, the, the world, uh, the Antichrist is already in the world. It's a fallen world uh, that's, uh, that's out there. Uh, there, there's nothing about this world uh, that gives us favor as being not Christians at all. Uh, uh, the values of this world are very different than ours. The values of this world follow pop culture. They follow the media. Uh, we see it in talk shows. We see it uh, in man-centered religious fads that, that uh, go around. Secular psychologists have done a study of this and talk about the greatest influences there are on culture. And the number, one cult, the one number one influence on culture, interesting, is music. Music. And it's, it's not the beat. <laughs> it's the words. You know, yeah, I, I would sometimes hear young guys uh, listening to, uh, uh, some, uh, to rap music, uh, certain types of rap, gangster rap and stuff, that's like, wow, do they even realize what they're saying in these songs? It's horrific. Uh, it's terrible. <laughs> How can you listen to that? I just like the beat. But yeah, but it's the words that influence. It's the words that go into, into, into the mind. Uh, and we have to be very careful. We were dead in our trespasses and sin, part of a world, and that world influences uh, us uh, very, very much so. The great, second greatest uh, influence is uh, uh, behind music is actually movies uh, and so forth. Tremendous uh, influence uh, over, uh, over people. And, and again, in our, our own culture, unfortunately, a lot of people live, uh, learn history, what they think is history, through, through, uh, through movies and, uh, and so forth. Uh, it's, um, uh, and, it, and it's just very, very interesting, the things that are uh, portrayed. Of course, uh, the Christians are never the good guys and, and so forth. And uh, the mass murderer always turns out to have a Bible in his back pop, pocket and uh, all this stuff. It's just, it's just amazing, you know, you know the, the, uh, the influence. It, it's no wonder it's like, you know, uh, you know, you know, you meet somebody and they and you, you identify yourself a, as a Christian, and they kind of take a step back. You're one of those, huh? you know. It's just like, actually, we're the good guy. You know, orphanages, hospital, caring for the people with AIDS. We're we're those guys, you know. But that's not the way we're portrayed out there in the uh, in the media. But it can uh, influence us, and we need to be careful. Uh, I know that Kathy and I love love to go to movies, see movies, and uh, but I I will go online. Focus on family site, unplug. There's another good uh, Christian site I go to. And I'll, I'll read about every movie before we go see. Because sometimes we won't go see it. It's just got <laughs> horrific language in it. Uh, scenes that we don't want to see. Uh, well, you can't really shelter yourself. Yeah, but I can try. <laughs> I can try the best I can. I mean, I, I still got to shop in Safeway. I still got to, you know, I know what it was to work in a union and in management and uh, be out there in the world and... And uh, I, I realize that people cuss, I get that, but uh, I don't need to, uh, for entertainment's sake, throw myself in that kind of uh, environment. I, I listen, I watch, and, and, uh, and there's some great films out there to see. Some, they're just funny, they're just entertaining, uh, and some actually have great messages to them and so forth, but they're a great influence uh, on, on our lives. It's, it's very simple. Our brains are like computers. It's garbage in, gar garbage out, and I... Love one, one of the guys said on the retreats, he says, uh, you know, sometimes if you've got your computer for a while, uh, after a while, 
you, you can't put anything else on it because uh, the hard drive is full. Uh, and, uh, and our object as believers is to keep the hard drive full of good stuff. <laughs> so there's no room for anything else to, uh, uh, to download. Uh, a great influencer is part of the world. And the world, and the, from the Bible's viewpoint, from a Christian world point, viewpoint, is usually an evil connotation. Uh, so there's, uh, there's the world, but then he mentions the, uh, that Satan or, or the devil. He's referred to as the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Uh, the prince of this world, it says uh, in John 12. Matthew 9 calls him the prince of demons. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, he's the god of this age. And he has host of a, uh, of a command of unseen fallen angels. And he controls everything that's, that's wrong uh, in this world. Uh, and, there, and there's plenty of wrong in this world. And we live in a day when, when uh, evil has become good and good has become evil. Because it's the world. It's the world that's out there. It's a world system. Uh, it's the, the way we view the world. Why is there evil in the world? Because we live in a fallen world. Uh, uh, and uh, there is the God of this age, Satan, doing very terrible things. Then we have our own flesh or, or the sin nature. Uh, that uh, uh, impacts us. And we, we thank God that when we come to faith in Christ, Paul says in Romans, we're given a, a new nature because that old nature uh, has a bent towards selfishness and self-centeredness and a very myopic view of things. Uh, and, uh, and, and we all completely understand that. If we lined all of us up after the service today and I said, hey, I want to take a picture of, of all of us to send uh, to uh, some friends that used to be part of the church. So let's all get out. We took the picture and I said, hey, if you want to see it later, I'm going to post it on Facebook. Uh, and you went and, uh, and looked at it later. Uh, if, you're, if you're like me and, and, and most people, uh, you would look at that picture. Of course, you'd be a tiny little head. You have to make it a lot bigger. Uh, and then you would look, oh, there I am. Yeah, that's a, that's a good expression. You know, it's like, how's everybody else? You know, uh, none of us look at the picture and go, I sure hope everybody else looks good. Because I don't care about myself. It's okay if I get a picture with my eyes shut. You know, I don't really care. I just care about everyone. No, that's not how we are by, uh, by nature. I like the uh, story of the little girl whose mother observed her uh, uh, kicking her brother in, uh, and pulling his hair. Uh, this is a story. This is, I didn't see this at home. I just thought I'd throw that in. <laughs> didn't think anything bad about Vanessa. But uh, 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 the, mother, the mother says to her, uh, did the devil make you kick your brother and pull his hair that way? And she says, well, not totally. Uh, the devil made me kick him, but pulling his hair was my own idea. <laughs> There's both. There's the devil at work, but we have our sin nature as well. Again, that's in verse 2. Paul says, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. There's the world. According to the prince of the power of the air, there's Satan. The spirit who now works in the sons, sons of disobedience. Uh, again, uh, those dead in the spirit, souls that are corrupted, influenced by, uh, by Satan because of the fall of uh, Adam, leaves us with this self-centered uh, attitude. Because of that, we follow certain, certain desires and certain thoughts and certain cravings that are placed within us. And, and John describes it. He doesn't have to describe uh, everything. He just puts them in three, one of three categories. In 1 John 2.15, where he says, Do not love the world, that's our subject, or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Uh, and here's the uh, defining statement where he qualifies things. For all that is in the world, three categories, come down to the lust of the flesh, or the lust of the eyes, or the pride of life is not of the Father, uh, but of this world. So we have three things working against us. Uh, that have separated us, it's our sin. In the context of that sin, we live in a fallen world. We have the devil or Satan and his cohorts against us, and we have our own sin nature. Uh, the third aspect is the fact that we are deserving of the wrath of God. That's what he says. We also were by nature uh, objects of wrath. I know you're thinking already, this is not exactly good news for me here. Hang on. We're going to get to the good news in a moment. Uh, but we were, you know, you have to see the, the bad before you can appreciate the, the good. We're all by nature objects of wrath. And uh, uh, that little 
phrase right there just summarizes the first three chapters of the book of Romans. Does that mean that everybody is equally evil? No, it doesn't. There's always room for deprovement. You know, you can, uh, there's always somebody worse and you can always get worse <laughs> yourself. Uh, does it mean that man is not capable of good? No man is. Uh, we're made in the image of God. We're, we're image bearers of God. Uh, and we all experience what we call common grace. Every person, whether they know Christ or not, experience God's grace to some degree. You don't have to be a born-again Christian to walk out on Kailua Beach this morning as the sun come up and just go, it's just awesome, man. What a beautiful day. How can a person appreciate something like that of God's creation? Common grace. They don't know God personally, but they have God's common grace. Uh, everybody can, could look at their baby being born, their son or daughter, and, and be in awe of that, that whole miracle and that experience. Does it mean uh, that they're a Christian or not? No, but they have a sense of awe of what's going on and an appreciation for this miracle that just took place. Why? Because of God's common, common grace. Uh, people are capable of doing some good things. And some people even though they are not Christians, learn over a period of time, though they wouldn't express it this way, that it's more blessed to give than to receive. You see men uh, like Bill Gates, who's got all the money in the world and a brilliant guy, uh, obviously founder of Microsoft. What's he doing with his life now? Now that he has it all, uh, he's out trying to do good for others through his foundation. Through, and, there, and him and his wife and that foundation are doing some wonderful things. Man is capable of doing some good. He's also capable of doing of horrific evil. But the bottom line is still, even though man experiences God's common grace, uh, apart from the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, he does not have saving grace. He's still separated uh, from God because of his sin. Paul says this in kind of summarizing those three chapters of Romans. Uh, as he opens there in verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Uh, there is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. How many do good? None. none. He makes it pretty clear. Uh, we're dead in our trespasses uh, and uh, in our sins. Uh, this is pretty foundational, again, to a Christian uh, worldview. Uh, this idea that we live in a fallen world, uh, that Satan impacts people's lives, and that all of us have a sin nature, and our sin has separated us uh, from God. Because of that, mankind, philosophically, uh, and for practical reasons, uh, uh, struggles with this idea uh, of God and acknowledging God. Because if we acknowledge him, we're going to have to acknowledge some accountability to him. Uh, and therefore, we have to figure a way around this. Uh, therefore, uh, great minds have come up with the idea of Darwinian evolution. Because otherwise, they're in trouble. Because everywhere you look in the universe, you see intricate design. And the better we get, the smarter we get, the more complex we can look at things. It just keeps bringing us back to there had to be a designer uh, of everything in the universe uh, and of our own bodies as well. Uh, in order to reject that idea, and I've heard some evolutionists, very brilliant guys, admit there is, there seems to be apparent design in the universe. It's not really there. It just seems like it because of the evidence, but it's not really there. Uh, it's just uh, uh, interesting. The, uh, again, the Bible uh, teaches what we'd say evolution on a horizontal plane. Uh, the Bible says that God created things according to their species. Uh, there, uh, there's not an issue with, uh, with species development and changing evolution in an evolution way, uh, adapting to environment. You know, there's different kinds of dogs or different kinds of birds and so forth. What we don't have is is uh, hippopotamuses turning into giraffes. We don't have elephants turning into lions. Uh, and we don't have uh, uh, simple uh, forms turning into complex forms. Uh, if we had that, we would have what's called transitionary forms. And there are none. That's why when we say, we make this statement that they want to burn us at the stake at, at the university level, that there are, is no evidence for Darwinian evolution because there's no transitionary forms. <laughs> Uh, National Geographic, a few years ago, uh, published an article 
hailed as the best evidence today for Darwinian evolution uh, and its so-called missing link. Uh, the scientific community uh, basically uh, uh, talked about a fossil they had discovered there in China that was a half bird and half dinosaur, therefore a irrefutable, they said, transitionary form. Uh, the problem was with uh, Archaeoraptor was that they had actually taken two fossils and put them together. Uh, and it looked good and they were famous for a while, uh, but it turned out not to, not to be true. Of course, National Geographic had a cover story letting people, no, actually they didn't. I mean, when these things are not to be fraud, they quite, don't quite mention that. And they actually leave some of these things in the museums that you visit today uh, and in the textbooks and, uh, and classrooms and, uh, and so forth. Uh, and uh, we could give others. One of my favorites is the Pelt Down Man, given to a skull fragment of a ape man discovered in 1912. Uh, of course, uh, uh, in time, that was uh, determined to be a scam as well. One of the more recent examples of the peppered moth, again showing evolution, that turned out that a scientist uh, took uh, dead moths and uh, glued them to a tree and photographed them and so forth. But why, why would uh, brilliant men do things like this, desperation, uh, out of simply desperation. Because we live in a fallen world, and men are dead in their trespasses uh, and sins, uh, and they do not want to uh, acknowledge God and therefore be accountable to God. Uh, it's the reality of the situation we're in today. And Paul says we're all in it. Doesn't matter if you're Jewish, doesn't matter if you're Gentile, we're all in the same predicament. Secondly, he says, why we receive the grace of God, and that's in verses 4 and 5. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love, which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. Uh, here's why, why we're saved. Uh, if we are dead in our trespasses and sin, if we have all these things going against us, uh, and we are, we are hopeless, I mean, between uh, the devil, uh, the world system that we live in, a fallen world, and a sin nature, uh, we don't have much of a shot here. So we're hopeless. So how is it that we get saved? We get saved by God's grace. Why would God do that? Because he's motivated by love, Paul says. Uh, John says in 1 John 4, 9, In this the love of God would manifest it towards us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. Uh, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation is just kind of a $5 word to, to say that, that God's wrath is deservingly coming down, uh, but God intervenes uh, through his son, and his son's death turns away the wrath of God away from us. Why would God do that? Why would he show us his grace? Because he's motivated by love, because he loves us. And that sometimes is a hard thing for somebody to get their mind around, I think, and especially uh, before we came to, uh, to faith in Christ. You know, we kind of hear that, hey, God loves you, Jesus loves you, has a wonderful plan for your life, and so forth, and we're just not too sure uh, about that. I know when I came to faith in Christ, and I uh, just out of absolute desperation got down on my knees and prayed, prayed a simple prayer, that God would forgive me and come into my life and bring transformation. I didn't really know if he'd do it. I, I didn't know if it was like, uh, maybe, I, maybe I'm past that uh, point of no return. Maybe God could care less. You know, maybe, you know, I had all those opportunities in youth group growing up. I had heard plenty of sermons uh, on the gospel and so forth. Uh, maybe at the, uh, the ripe old age of uh, 28 or whatever I was, maybe it was uh, uh, too late. I thought I was pretty old at that time, and, uh, and uh, maybe it was just too late. But I was willing to give it a shot. Uh, but God is motivated by love. Uh, it's a love that's hard for us to understand sometimes. Paul says, secondly, he's motivated uh, by his mercy. Notice, because God is rich uh, in mercy. Again, mercy is giving us uh, what... Uh, uh, what we uh, don't deserve, that the grace he gives us, uh, the mercy means he doesn't give us the punishment that we deserve. Uh, it's, uh, it's what makes him uh, show his grace to us. And then third, God must help us uh, because we cannot, as I said before, help ourselves. Now, in the opening chapter, verse 19, Paul's already uh, made this wonderful point about God's power in our lives. When he says in verse 19 of chapter 1, what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his uh, mighty power? 
We're dead in our trespasses and sin. We are absolutely hopeless unless God intervenes uh, uh, on our behalf. And he intervenes with a power that is so great that Paul says it's the same power that rose uh, Christ uh, from the dead. Uh, we can talk about when we were seeking after God. Some uh, churches even use that phrase. We're trying to reach the seekers, you know, and it's like, well, you know, in reality, you know, we might say when I came to Christ, but when we do, we find out that it was actually God that was coming after me the, the whole time. And the only reason I ever looked at him or looked up or even thought about my, uh, my circumstance at all, uh, the only reason I read a track or heard a message or somebody shared something, kind of registered something in my, uh, in my little brain up there, was because God was actively seeking uh, after me. Uh, God must help us because we cannot help ourselves. So there's a reality uh, to our situation, living in a fallen world. Uh, we must receive God's grace in order to be saved. And then in verses 6 to 10, this is the good part, uh, the results of God's grace uh, in, uh, in our lives. Uh, here Paul says, And raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand uh, that we should walk in them. So I've listed at uh, five results here of coming to faith and uh, by God's grace. And the first one is being... Uh, uh, raised up and seated with Christ uh, in the heavenly realms. Because we've been uh, made alive by the power of God, we're united to him. We use that phrase over and over again in the New Testament, to be in Christ. We are in Christ Jesus. And Christ Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. Uh, the writer of Hebrews says, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Uh, Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of God, intercede, interceding for us. Uh, the writer of Hebrews puts it this way, who being the brightness of his glory, speaking of Jesus, the express image uh, of his person, in upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And the whole point there is that he sat down. It means his work is complete, that it's done. If you were to look at a, at, a, at a little schematic drawing or a plan of the tabernacle or the temple and so forth, uh, you could see the different places where the altar was, where the altar of incense, where the showbread was. You, you could just diagram it all out. The, the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was, where the high priest could only go in. You could look at it uh, uh, eight different ways, and one thing you'll ever find in that diagram is a break room. I don't know if you've got a break room at work, but uh, we used to have one at Safeway. And uh, you only wanted to take a break in the break room. If you were taking a break and you weren't in the break room, you're probably going to get in trouble. But uh, uh, it's where you went to take a break. There wasn't one because the priest's work was never done. There was never enough sacrifices. There always had to be another one. There always had to be another goat, another bull, another set of doves that had to be offered. They could never sit down. That's the significance of Jesus sitting down. His work for our salvation uh, is complete and we are seated with him uh, in the heavenlies. The second results include being showed, showing that God's kindness expressed by his grace when he says, uh, in order that in the future he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to him. Uh, we, we are to us. Uh, we are the incomparable riches of God. Now, last time we saw, uh, there's a reference to we're his inheritance. He sees us as his inheritance. Uh, he sees us as his great uh, riches uh, as, as well. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I think about this in, uh, in terms of, uh, I, don't, I don't know what you consider to be your riches. I don't know if it's your 401k or, uh, or what's parked in your garage or, you know, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, but, you know, for, as you get a little older, uh, the, the material things mean uh, less to you and people mean a lot, a lot more. And, uh, 
uh, for a period of time there where uh, our son Josh is in the Air Force. He's traveling all over the world. And then for a while, uh, Melissa and Peter and the uh, grandkids were uh, in Japan. Uh, and I've got a spot in, in my Bible in Proverbs where I've got the dates listed when we're actually all together at one time. It only, it's only happened a couple of times, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, the re, re, recent number of years and so forth. And, um, and I've got the da- dates marked there. Uh, and it's by a scripture that says that the wise man will have a house full of treasures. And those are my treasures. And that's, what, that's when it happens. Uh, those are the real treasures to me. And we're like that to God. Now, that's an amazing thing. That's a result of God's grace. We could have never reached him. We could have never done it. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. We had the world against us, devil against us, a sin nature. God, because he was motivated by his love, showed us his mercy, and he considers us. One of the results is that uh, we are part of his incomparable riches. Third, the results include our understanding of the method of salvation. You know, once we get saved, we kind of get it. <laughs> you know, like I say, you know, we, we kind of think, well, well, I've always been interested in spiritual things. You know, well, awesome. You know, but, you know, but still it was God that came, came after you and captivated your heart and opened your eyes uh, to the truth and, uh, uh, and the need for salvation. We, we get it that it's by, by the grace of God. But there's a lot of people that don't, that are still out there. Uh, and they share what I call, what I call, Kermit salvation, Kermit salvation. You've probably heard of that. <laughs> like in the frog, Kermit the frog. So here's the illustration. You put a frog in a bucket of, uh, uh, of milk uh, and he's gonna drown or swim. So he begins digging and he's swimming and he's going and he's going. See, he's working, he's working. He's gonna work his way out of that bucket. And eventually he churns enough that the milk turns into butter, it solidifies, he's able to hop out. That's salvation in a lot of people's view. If I can work hard enough, do all the right things, eventually I'm going to get there and I'm going to be saved. That's, that's the view of a lot of people in our culture. Uh, but Paul is very careful to tell us first what salvation is not. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed that. He emphasized it's not by works so that no one uh, can, can boast. Uh, and uh, mentions that a, a, a few times. Uh, we could all go down to, uh, to Kailua Beach after church today uh, and go for a swim. Where are we going to go? We're going to swim to Molokai. And some of us are going to make it a lot farther than others. <laughs> Nobody's going to get there. That's the whole issue. I mean, our sin has separated us. We're dead in our trespasses and sin. Our good works, no matter what they are, will never add up to enough to get us there. Are some people better people than others? Are some people more kind? Absolutely. Are some people more evil? Yeah. Look at ISIS. That's about as evil as you can get. Uh, and so there, there is a, a great disparity here, but still nobody can get there. Uh, our good works could never get us there. Paul tells us how we're not saved, but he tells us how we are saved. For it is by grace you have been saved through, through faith. Uh, it's, it's a gift of God. And, and it's very clear in a Greek text, uh, the gift is the grace, it is not faith. Uh, God, by his grace, saves us. Uh, but it's up to us whether we'll place our faith uh, in Jesus Christ or not. If there's no faith, there's no grace. If there's no grace, uh, then there's no salvation. Well, you're saying pretty much all we've got to do then is believe. That's right. That's what Paul's saying. That's what we have to do. In the New Testament, uh, uh, reaffirms that over and over again in Acts 16, 31. So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. In Acts 13, 39, uh, and by him, everyone who believes is justified from things from which you could not be justified by the law. Over in Romans 4, 5, but to him who does not work, but believes on him, on Jesus, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for uh, righteousness. And we do need to distinguish between our English word faith and what that really means. Because after all, there's a lot of people that believe and have proper uh, belief in terms of theology and so forth, but are not saved. Sometimes I refer to that uh, as a Warren Wordsby term, call that uh, demonic faith. Wow, that's pretty harsh. Well, that's what James says. James says, even the demons believe there's one God. Boy, they got good theology. And they shudder. They have an emotional experience. 
but obviously they're, they're not saved. Some people can have an emotional experience, can have proper theology, have never put their faith, faith and trust uh, in Jesus Christ. And I, I love to uh, illustrate it uh, this way. Uh, it's been told a lot. I, I told this story one time. It's about a, uh, a guy named uh, the Great Blondin, uh, and he was a high wire uh, guy uh, that uh, a, number, a number of years ago. Uh, but uh, uh, he, uh, I was telling the story one time, and, uh, and when I got done, I even showed a, a picture of him and stuff. Uh, two guys in the front row came up. They were uh, both in the Army at Schofield, living in County Oi, both brothers uh, st- stationed together. It was pretty cool. And they said, uh, hey, you know, we've heard that story before and everything. That's our grandfather. Really? And they go, yeah, my dad got pictures of him, you know, doing all this stuff and everything. Uh, it was pretty cool. His real name is uh, uh, Jean-Francois Gavalette. No wonder he was known as the Great Blondin. I, I think that's a little easier since most of his stuff was done in, in, uh, in England and uh, in America. Mm-hmm. Born in France in 1824. He once played the violin on a tightrope 170 feet above the ground. Uh, it, most of his more spectacular feats were done over the Niagara Falls. Uh, 1,100 feet long, 160 feet above the water. On one occasion, he took a stove out there and uh, made an omelet. Uh, on another occasion, he pushed a wheelbarrow uh, across the, the falls. Uh, on another time, he stood on his head uh, on the wire. Uh, and today in, uh, in England, uh, there's uh, two streets kind of named after him. They're cross streets, Niagara and Blondin. It's because of these events uh, that, uh, that took place during uh, his career. Uh, on, on one event, he carried a man on his back across the wire. Uh, and when he made it back again, he asked the crowd if they thought he could do it again. Uh, and, they, and they yelled out, uh, of course, we just saw you do it. And he, uh, so he said to that man, hop on my back and I'll take you across. And he said, are you kidding? You're crazy. I'm not getting on your back. See, there's a difference between belief. Yes, I believe you can do it. I just saw you. Get on my back. I ain't doing it. There's a difference between simply believing and actually, actually trusting. Uh, and it's those two things that, that save us. And I would have said the same thing of that man because of three factors. The me factor, I could lose my balance and both of us would fall down. Uh, the chance factor, uh, the rope could break and we'd come tumbling down. And then the blonded factor, uh, my luck, it'd be the one time the guy fell and then, then we'd come tumbling down. But there's a big difference between Jesus Christ and the great blonde. And Jesus will never fall. And Jesus will never let us down. And his salvation for us is complete. And so therefore, we can not just have a belief system, but actually put our trust uh, in him. Uh, And Paul here, again, in these little verses, very compactly, uh, really lays out the gospel of Jesus Christ. Man is sinful by nature, dead to spiritual things, but by grace, uh, we are saved. Uh, The fourth result uh, includes becoming God's workmanship. Here it's the Greek word poema, where we get our word poem. Uh, It also means that which is made, and it's usually a reference to a masterpiece or a piece of artwork. Uh, Kent Hughes says that uh, uh, not just the wonder of creation uh, that we see in nature, not even the wonder of a newborn baby can compare with the wonder of the new birth of a person who receives Jesus uh, as Lord and Savior. That's the ultimate uh, uh, masterpiece, workmanship. Uh, Paul puts it this way in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, a new masterpiece. The old is gone. Uh, The new uh, has uh, come. Uh, We are his workmanship. Uh, Whether it's true or not, just for the sake of illustration, there's a story of uh, someone coming to Michelangelo as he was uh, working on a marble sculpture. Uh, It is said that the person uh, asked him uh, what... What he was doing is he was chipping away, and he says, I am attempting to liberate an angel from within this piece of marble. In other words, he could see the image. All he had to do was keep chipping and chipping and chipping away until the angel, this beautiful angel carved in marble, would emerge away from a block of marble. Now, whether it's true or not, it's a good illustration of what God does to us and through us. Through Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, the difficulties of this life, uh, abuse of some people, uh, saints in the Lord that encourage us, uh, God chips and chips and chips away, and what emerges is his masterpiece, his poema. Uh, We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. And um, 
I, I pray that for some people sometimes, not anyone here, of course, but for other people in that other service. I pray, Lord, continue to chip away because there's a few rough spots there. And I pray that in my own life as well. Uh, we all need a little chipping away, uh, but God is faithful to do it, not to harm us, but to create something beautiful from us. We are his workmanship. The fifth result is this idea of being created uh, to do good works. Now, Paul's just said that we're not saved by good works, but uh, there's a result of his grace and having come to faith in Jesus Christ that, well, well it's just, uh, it's what we end up doing. We end up doing good works because it's the least that we, <laughs> we can do uh, for what God has done, uh, done for us. Uh, Calvin, what is attributed to Calvin, uh, that uh, the line that says, uh, faith alone saves, but saving faith is never alone. <laughs> it, it, it never stops there because now God's in you and he's working. Luther put it this way, justification by faith alone, uh, but not by faith that is alone. Uh, for where there is faith, uh, there are works. Uh, and again, Paul writes about this idea on several occasions, this the, the works that we do for the Lord is a result of his grace. Colossians 1.9, for this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge uh, of God. It's just part of the process. And, uh, you know, one of the, uh, uh, one of the things that uh, I told everybody in the first service, I said, well, next week you're going to get to hear Mark lead, lead worship. You're used to having uh, Greg and everything. And, and I, I told him, I, but I gotta, I've got to warn you of, uh, of one thing. Once in a while, he does a Bob Dylan song. But you have to blame that on me because I'm the guy that, that put him up to it. Uh, because, because when I, when I, when I, the year I got saved is the year that Bob Dylan uh, got, got saved. And uh, he came out with a couple of albums. Uh, and uh, in one of them, uh, the, the line in it was, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's just about all the Lord's done, these things we've been talking about, the results of grace, and the chorus is, you know, uh, and what can I do for you? It's just the natural respo response. You know, what, what could I possibly? And i tell you the truth, what I thought I could do for the Lord, I, I didn't think he'd have anything for me. I, it's, it's literally, when we first started going to Calvary Hill a little uh, I saw one of the guys kind of sweeping up ahead of time uh, and everything. I was hoping I could work my way up into that position. Yeah. I, I ain't kidding because I thought if they, they really knew who I was, they wouldn't even let me attend church here, you know. So uh, I, I didn't really know if I could work my way up in that position. Although I have to admit, after six months in the nursery, I was ready for a promotion. I, I, I do have to admit that. But I did, I did give it a shot. And, uh, and that's when the nursery was uh, uh, underneath the hallway. Uh, in the outside, and we do this little playpen, meaning at uh, Punahou at Dillingham Hall. My job is to try to keep the mosquitoes away from the babies. But, uh, uh, you know, I was just happy. I was just so, I was happy as a clam to be uh, doing something for the Lord after all he had done for me. But he's got good works that he has prepared in advance uh, for us to do. And there's nothing more beautiful uh, than being his workmanship. Again, the realities, we're lost uh, in a fallen world, and we've got a sin nature uh, and, the, and the devil on our case half the time. Uh, we receive God's grace only because of his love and because of his mercy, and the results are our lives are absolutely changed forever, and we begin to become his masterpiece, his poema, and he's, he's got just great things prepared in advance for us to walk in, that fit us that he equips us for, and it becomes just a, a delight to, to be able to, uh, uh, to do them. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, let's pray. Lord. In Christ, then he has become a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold. God no longer knows the things that brought you to this place. 
here.